five o'clock session. So uh, take a seat. I don't know how long that will last for you. Uh, given we have uh, Larry Swanson here. Um, he's here to talk to us about sitting and not sitting. So please give a warm welcome. Thank you, guys. Uh, my name's Larry. I'm a massage therapist and a personal trainer here in Seattle. I'm developing an area that I call office fitness. Jen calls it keyboard athletes. It's, we're all doing the same thing. It's about how to keep your desk job from killing or maiming you. That's what I'm about. And so I call sitting less office fitness habit number one. That's the main thing we all have to be doing. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to quickly make the case against sitting, show you the scientific evidence of why it's so bad. Because people, I still run into a lot of people like, come on, it can't be that bad. It's bad. I'll show you in just a sec. Uh, then we'll briefly look at how habit formation works, because we all have this sitting habit that we need to break. So I'll talk a little bit about that, how we can uh, develop a habit formation model. And then I'll give you a quick assignment, uh, your 30-day assignment. So um, our grandparents had crummy, horrible jobs. We were all working in factories and mines and uh, you know, running the risk of being obliterated by a factory explosion or breathing coal dust all day. We started getting our office jobs and feeling pretty good about things. Life is looking up. We're inside. We're not being crushed by farm machinery. We're not being blown to smithereens. We're not breathing coal dust all day. It's looking good until you flash forward about 50 years. The clicker, there we go. And all of a sudden we realize we're contorted into these unnatural positions. We're getting carpal tunnel syndrome and headaches all day and our shoulders are killing us. Our low back is killing us. Worse yet, as we look into it, we find out that this activity is deadly. And so I'm going to talk a little bit right now about the science behind exactly why sitting is so deadly. Kind of comes in three waves of research. First, there's this epidemiological evidence that comes out that like, holy cow, people who sit a lot get sick more and die earlier. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Then that leads to curiosity about what's going on. What's, what's the mechanism behind that? That's this whole new field uh, called inactivity physiology. And then all of these papers end with something like, well, it's dangerous, maybe we should be moving more. And we're just now getting to the point of doing some specific research on interventions around uh, breaking up our long spells of sitting. So let's look first at the epidemiological evidence. I just like saying that word. It started with uh, this guy Bernard, Bernardino Ratmanzini. I'm, saying, I'm sure I'm mangling his name. But he's this 17th century Italian physician who's generally regarded as the, the kind of the founder of modern occupational medicine. He noticed that cobblers and tailors and people who sat around all day got sick a lot more than messengers and other active people who were up running around all day. So this was replicated about 100 years later in London. Some doctors observed the same thing. But you really have to jump forward a couple hundred years to the mid 20th century to this famous research this guy Jeremy Morris did on double-decker buses in London. He looked at the, the, in the exact same working conditions, there you have a driver who's sitting all day, and then you have a conductor who's up moving around all day, taking tickets, running up and down the steps, doing all that. They discovered that the drivers had twice the risk of sitting disease as the conductors. There was some criticism of the methodology about like, well, maybe fat guys just choose to take the sitting job. They've corrected out for all that. This, this research has been replicated many times now. Um, a second wave of this kind of research happened in the mid-90s with couch potatoes in Australia. Some Australian uh, scientists got curious about long-term spells of inactivity and what that was doing to people. So they looked at, at, at uh, you know, people who just sat a lot. They just correlated sitting. And this, this led to a whole bunch of research in this area. But basically it shows that sitting a lot is an independent risk factor for a whole bunch of bad diseases, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and all this stuff. Worse yet, you can't exercise your way out of the problem. Sedentariness and sitting disease are a separate, unique risk, risk factor. It's independent of any other. You can be a fit, running a marathon every weekend. If you sit all day at work, you're still at risk for these problems. So that's the epidemiological stuff. Uh, the this clicker is a little, maybe if I, anyhow, so that obviously leads to some curiosity about like, what's going on? What's killing all these people? You've probably all seen this famous infographic about how sitting is killing us. That was the first attempt. Oh, maybe you haven't. OK, so anyhow, <laughs> it's, it's been for, to me, it's like everywhere. You can't get away from it. Um, 
but anyhow, this was the first attempt to kind of round up, you know, what happens when you sit down? Uh, Mark Hamilton, the guy who actually coined this term inactivity physiology, it was famously quoted in, uh, there was a New York Times article with the headline, is sitting a lethal activity? He was quoted in that article as saying, as soon as you sit down, the muscles in your body go as the dead as those, no, as silent as those of a dead horse. You know, it's like, boom, everything shuts down. And we subsequently learned things like, there's these muscles deep in your calves that just, everybody stand up for just a second, do a couple little toe raises. You have just engaged your soleus muscle, which is helping pump blood back up to your heart. So that's one of the things you're sitting, that puppy's turned off, nothing happening. Another thing that Mark Hamilton discovered was that uh, you can sit, or you guys can stay standing if you want. I mean, <laughs> however you want to work, yeah. It's like, yeah, I, I stand all the time, so this is normal for me, but I know a lot of people are like, oh God, can we actually stand all the time? And there's research that shows that we can, by the way. Um, so anyhow, so there's tons of stuff that goes, oh, Mark Hamilton, the guy who coined this phrase, inactivity physiology, one of his discoveries is that when we stand, simply standing versus sitting engages some deep postural muscles that not only hold us upright, they also secrete an enzyme that helps regulate cholesterol level, levels. Um, NASA discovered they were doing research to um, try to mimic weightlessness by having people lay in bed all day. And they found that just standing up every 30 minutes helped to regulate blood pressure. So there's all kinds of little, there's still much more needs to be discovered about this, but there's tantalizing evidence that like, of what the, the underlying physiological mechanisms are in, in sitting disease. And then finally, uh, they're beginning to do some intervention studies. Like, okay, virtually, like I said, virtually all of those studies end with like, holy crap, this is dangerous. It makes sense to stand up periodically. Now, we still don't know the precise dosage of not standing, you know, but we're starting to get some evidence. So there's been a lot of research on people working at treadmill desks, at standing desks, using these little under desk uh, pedaling and exercise gizmos. Basically, the hypothesis had been confirmed that when you're standing, you're burning more calories than when you're sitting. When you're walking, you're burning more calories than when you're standing. Um, that basically, you know, that, that kind of logical hypothesis that, yeah, we should be out moving more. And if you think about it, we're human beings. We're designed to move. It's kind of unnatural to shove us into a desk all day. So, and one last thing I just want to talk about. You know, this, when you talk about research, there's like all this data and all this we, I tend to get, at least I tend to get lost in like the, the, the numbers behind it, but these are horrific diseases. The difference between being healthy in old age and not is vast. You know, you're, you're, it's demonstrated that sitting all day increases your risk of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, metabolic syndrome, all kinds of things that are not any good. So this can be the difference between spending your last five years of your life with tubes in your throat and all this stuff or out jogging with your grandkids. So that's all the fear mongering I'm going to do today, but I did want to, <laughs> did want to point that out. Um, there we, oops, let me go back to, I love this kid. So I want to talk now just really quickly about habits and how we form them. I'm going to review, I've spent months immersed in this and trying to articulate, because there's a bunch of different ways you can come at habits and habit formation. And I think, anyhow, let me know what you, you guys let me know what you think of the work I've done here to, to extract some lessons from this. But basically, we're, um, we're kind of, we all have this horrible sitting habit right now. And I would argue that these fancy, er like this is probably the coolest, fanciest ergonomic setup you could have these days. And it's the worst possible thing because it makes you comfortable with sitting all day. I would rather have like a wooden church pew or something <laughs> like, you know, like get up, buddy. Um, so, but w so we need to be standing more, like to take phone calls. We need to be maybe working at a standing desk all day, uh, taking walking meetings instead of sitting in a stupid, <laughs> you know, weird HVAC conference room, or maybe even working on a treadmill desk. That's a viable option nowadays. Um, so how do you get there? How do you develop good habits? Now, you know, there's been all these, half the speakers today have been psychologists, so I feel very presumptuous talking about this. I'll just put that out up front. But I've done a ton of reading and research, and I feel confident in, in kind of wrapping up what scientists, psychologists mostly, but other disciplines as well have discovered about how habits work. In fact, we're kind of in the golden age of habit learning. Oops. Uh, you, many of you have probably seen Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habit. This is everywhere now. And he identifies this, this, this is like the micro level of habits, like how habits work. We all kind of know what a habit is, but there's actually a wide range of 
activities that we might identify as habitual, but the pure definition of it is a, is an, a routine that you, is, you're cued or reminded to do that has a reward. Duhigg famously uses the example of um, Pepsodent toothpaste. There was this, like 100 years ago, people didn't brush their teeth routinely. So he uses the, there was this marketing executive who figured out that uh, he just wanted to establish this routine of people brushing their teeth so he could t sell a ton of toothpaste. He's like, dang, how can I do this? So he figures out that there's this film. You can all run your tongue over your teeth right now. We all have it. It's completely natural, harmless, doesn't do anything. But he was like, oh, you've got film on your teeth. You've got to brush your teeth. And you'll be rewarded with a sparkling, sunny smile. And so this is the habit loop that he, that this more, and this guy made a gazillion dollars selling Pepsodent. But, and the insight that, that Duhigg points out, that this guy, he adequately and accurately identified the habit loop, but he missed the fact that underlying all this is a craving. And in the case of Pepsi, there was some chemical or something in the toothpaste that kind of made your tongue tingle, you know, and there was this craving for that sensation uh, that underlay the whole thing. So anyhow, so that's Duhigg's model. There's another guy, B.J. Fogg, who looks at, you know, when you think about cues and reminders, you can also call them triggers of how, a ha how you'll do an activity. And so this is Fogg's model of behavior change. Like on this axis, how motivated are you to do it? And on this axis, how hard is the activity? What's your ability to do it? So for example, if you're a smoker, which is really hard to do, it's really hard to quit smoking, and you're like, I don't care, what am I gonna do? I'm a goner anyway. You're low motivation, on a hard task, you're way down in this quadrant, nothing you can do is gonna trigger you to replace that and quit that smoking habit. On the other hand, if you've been freaked out by all these articles about you're gonna die of dehydration if you don't drink a, drink a glass of water after every meal, that's, you know, you're highly motivated because you're convinced you're gonna die if you don't drink enough water, and it's easy enough to just go over to the tap and pour a glass of water after every meal. You're way up in that corner of the quadrant. So this is just a helpful model to think about as you're undertaking any kind of habit change, can I cross that activation threshold? That's, that's the point of that. I've looked at a ton of other models. This is Jaeger's or Jaeger's model of how habits themselves feed back into your attitudes. There's a, I'm gonna show you just a few of these, just to show you, I'm kind of just showing you that I've done my homework basically, but these are fascinating um, models to explore. Like this one, Wood and Neil looked at the, 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 um, the relationship of goals and goal formation and habits and how Goals obviously can inform the habitual behaviors that you try to uh, adopt, how habits and goals interact, and then how those habits feed back into subsequent, um, uh, inf how they inform subsequent goals. Uh, but that's a lot of stuff. Oh, and there's one more model I wanted to show. This is from environmental science world, and this is a bigger model of like, uh, you know, you think of an amoeba, stimulus response. You know, sometimes behavior change is that simple. You're in a bu bunch of pain and you figure out that a standing desk will help it, boom, you just go buy a standing desk and you're doing the new behavior and there you go. But more often it's moderated by unreasoned influence and this is where habits fit in this model. Habits are even reflexes. You bang your knee and you know, your leg straightens out. And then there's reasoned influences and this gets in, I mean this is kind of like a whole bunch of psychological concepts put into a chart. Um, and then anyhow, I'm beginning to adopt this for like the project of getting people to sit less. So that's, that's the point of this. Uh, chart. But anyhow, this is, that's a lot of stuff. And I've tried to condense all of that psychological insight into just three simple things you can do when you're trying to adopt a new behavior. And they, the three, I call them the three R's. There's the three little R's, like in Duhigg's model, that routine, uh, I mean the, rec the reminder routine and reward, I call those the three little R's, that's kind of the micro level of, of how habits actually work. But if you're trying to create a new habit, you want to resolve to do it. This is like the idea of a New Year's resolution. And we're going to talk about each of these steps in detail in a minute because we're going to apply them to our task today. So you need resolve. You need to resolve to do it. You need to rehearse. Just as an orchestra or a cast and crew of a play, have to rehearse, you have to practice and, and uh, set yourself up for success. And then you have to repeat and repeat and repeat. I'm bummed that Fisher's not here because <laughs> He had this model, he had a bunch of post-its up here of things you didn't want to do and wanted to take off of here. And one of the things about repetition, and we'll talk about this more in a minute, is that I, I, you notice I'm talking about forming new habits, not breaking bad habits. One of the benefits of repetition is that there's no room for the bad habit if you're repeating the good habit. So anyhow, that's the, the, the point of that. 
So let's look at each of those in turn and apply them to helping you sit less. But first, I want to return to the science to figure out what our dosage of not sitting should be is, if that makes sense. So um, first, th I'm just going to throw out a few random data points. Not random. These are carefully selective. So the American Institute of Cancer Research summarized in a press release a couple years ago a whole bunch of research that they had done. And they determined that as little as a minute or two of physical, li low, that LIPA means a low intensity physical activity per hour was enough to reduce biomarkers associated with cancer risk, things like waist circumference, um, uh, you know, blood sugar levels, cholesterol levels, that kind of thing. Um, so, so even just standing up once an hour can help you. Uh, NASA, I mentioned this earlier, they discovered that simply standing up every 30 minutes and then going right back to lying down in the bed, simply that act of standing, they, they identified it with uh, mechanoreceptors in the neck that help regulate blood pressure. So simply standing every 30 minutes can help regulate your blood pressure. Then this guy, David Dunstan, and his colleagues in Australia, <coughs> excuse me, um, did more intense research that looked at, you know, specifically going into offices and having people do a bunch of different things. One of the research, <laughs> one of the guys before this did like eight minutes on an exercise bike every hour. So I'm like, who has 10 minutes an hour? You know, so that wasn't very realistic. But this one, I think, is totally realistic to do just stand up for two minutes every 20 minutes. And even just standing, you know, just from the NASA evidence and the AICR evidence is probably enough. But if you can do some light activity, I do a lot of squats and lunges and, you know, whatever at my desk. So, but one last thing about this, the dosage, is this is in an office context. We all have jobs. We have to do things. So we have to balance any of this stuff against productivity. So in your calculus, in your calculation of, like, how you're going to work this out, you know, I'm really targeting technical and creative professionals in what I'm doing here, and they're often in flow. You know, if you're writing or creating marketing materials or writing a computer program, there's this need almost to dive in there. So I'm going to urge people not to beat themselves up if they, if they aren't achieving their non-sitting goals because they're getting their job done. You know, but you just, so you just want to consider that. So taking all this into consideration, I'm going to recommend that we take three short breaks per hour. You know, this kind of goes to that once every 20 minutes, simply stand up. If that's all the time you've got for, great, let's do that. So now we'll return to the three R's. Uh, and I'm just going to talk, the, the thing I want to say about this, I'm going to go into some of the details of each of these three R's. But if you just think about it, resolution, just like, boom, you set your jaw, you're firmly, you're ready to go. That's all you got to do to resolve to do something. I'm going to talk about some the details and ideas about specifically how to do it, but just think about, damn it, I want to do this. That's the, the, the underlying thing of resolve. First thing about resolve, you think of New Year's resolutions. And the reason New Year's resolutions never work is because you wake up on New Year's Day and you go, my life is going to be perfect from this moment on. I'm going to run every day. I'm going to improve my relationships. I, you know, everything in my life is going to be better. Well, of course it's not <laughs> because you can't do all that. Nobody's got the bandwidth for that. So I argue that you want to be a steward of your resources, to be realistic in your assessment of what you can actually accomplish when you set out to establish a new habit. That's, that's what stewardship of resources is about. Um, you want to, a couple of the speakers today have talked about intention and, and uh, I, I don't recall any specific goal setting, but basically you want to have, y your resolution needs to align with your bigger goals. So for example, this, we're going to, in a minute, I'm going to ask you guys to all stand for 20, once every 20 minutes. Does that align with your goals for living a long and healthy and productive life? I think that's, I hope that's a slam dunk. <laughs> Anyhow, um, let's click, click, there we go. Again, I lived in Missouri for a while, the show me state. I want evidence that supports any decision that I undertake. Again, like this one, it's sort of like, um, well, the sitting example. I, th I hope that I made my case when I outlined the, 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 the abundant evidence about how bad sitting is. And so with any, any kind of behavior change project that you undertake, I, I want evidence behind it. I, like I'm a massage therapist, and in that world, there's a lot of people like, oh, this guy told me I should put my feet in electric water and that's going to and people will start doing that. I'm like, really? What's the evidence there? <laughs> you know, so that's I'm, I'm more in that evidence based world. Um, there's also this aspect of you got to believe that's a big part of resolve and resolution is um, 
it, there was, there's kind of two concepts involved here. There's the psychological notion of self-efficacy, this belief in yourself. And all you have to do is, is like, I'm just asking, going to ask you to stand once every 20 minutes for the rest of your day. I'm sure you can all look back in your lives and find harder things that you've undertaken and were successful at. So that's the notion of self-efficacy. Belief is really interesting. One of the, anyhow, a quick aside, because I, I love this story. The success of Alcoholics Anonymous has driven researchers nuts for years. Here's a guy at the end of his rope, drunk guy in New York in his apartment, somehow comes up with the most successful behavior change program in the history of humanity. And he's like, you know, the academics are like, we've got PhDs and stuff. We, how can he, you know, so they got over their snippiness. They finally looked at what's going on there and why it works. He, he hit on a bunch of stuff. The repetition, the fact that you meet every day and regularly, the relationships and community, the fact that you have a sponsor. But one of the things that underlies the whole thing, the fact that it has 12 steps, comes down to belief. He, was, he wasn't a religious guy himself, but he adopted the 12 apostles as the basis for the 12 steps. Anyhow, and it turns out, there's that re research now that shows that that belief is an important component. So, you know, we all should believe in ourselves anyway, but especially in habit formation, both that micro level, like self-efficacy thing, and then that like, sometimes the belief in a bigger power can, can help you get your, your goals. Um, you may have seen the uh, Baumeister and Tierney's book, Willpower, that's out now. It basically, the, the key insight in that book is that willpower and especially decision, the, the willpower is a finite um, resource. It's much like a muscle. You can exercise it to strengthen it, but you can't do, just as you can't do an infin infinite number of push-ups, you can't make good decisions all day. So you want to muster your willpower and so you can make good decisions. Finally, a public proclamation can really help with resolve. You know, you, you have, you, in fact, everybody stand up right now, raise your right hand. I proclaim here in front of Larry and all these lovely people that I am going to try to stand for tw once every 20 minutes for the next 30 work days. So if you guys could repeat that. I, your name, pledge to stand for 30, once every 20 minutes for the next 30 work days. There, now you're all accountable to one another for this and your resolve has been strengthened. So you guys ready to do this? We're ready, we resolved, we're ready to go? Okay, the next two steps are really obvious. Like just as you have, as actors rehearse a play uh, you need to rehearse the new behavior. So we just stood up, you've rehearsed. That's easy enough. We've all rehearsed that. Um, that's you've practiced the behavior. Just as an actor practices their lines and their cues, uh, it happens, but th that's part of it. But it happens in the context of a cast and crew. There's a supporting cast. So just for a simple project like this, it, this might, you might need to do something as simple as like alert your coworkers and your boss that you're going to be doing this. So they're not like, God, Jara seems really antsy lately. What's going on? Why is she standing up all the time? Um, so, but you want to enlist your, your, your team in, in uh, helping you accomplish this. Another thing about rehearsal is visualization. There's all kinds of angles to this, but basically just as an actor visualizes uh, the applause at the end of a show or uh, Babe Ruth envision, uh, visualizes a home run, you can visualize your new behavior uh, repeating over and over again. And just as you have in a theater setting, stages and a stage and props, the environment and the setting can help set you up for success too. You have, uh, just for example, uh, if you have a job where the phone rings a lot, just put a post-it on your phone that says stand up. Every time you reach for the phone, you stand up. That can be one prop you can use. And one last thing here, in a lot of this research, they've discovered that having keystone habits, like people who make their bed every morning, more easily adopt other habits. So look around in your life for little things like that. Just doing dishes every night. That's, for me, that's been a bad one. I've been doing that for about a month now. I'm like, hey, my life is better. This is great. Um, so look for some keystone habits. And oh, wait, I, I, I just wanted to have this slide because we've rehearsed, and I just love that fake moose. I just had to put that in my presentation. Sorry. OK, self-indulgence over with. We'll move on to the next thing. And then repetition. Quick poll. How many days does it take to establish a new habit? OK, so that 21-day thing is totally made up. This guy, Maxwell Maltz, I think was his name. He wrote this book called Psycho-Cybernetics in the late 50s, early 60s. And um, basically, he, he worked, uh, had occasion at some point to work with amputees and discovered that you could adapt to the loss of a limb in 21 days. And he thought, well, if you can do that, you can do anything. So only recently, um, 
have we learned that there are no magic numbers. Philippa Lolly, this woman in England, has done research that shows that it actually takes somewhere between 18 and 254 days. So if you think back to, you know, depending, like if you want to drink a glass of water after every meal, 20 days. You can probably instill that as a habit. If you want to, like, um, you know, uh, uh, have a, you know, con convert to a completely macrobiotic diet and become a, a chef, or, you know, th that can take a lot longer. If you think back to Fogg's model, that ability versus motivation thing, it just totally aligns with that, that the harder it is, the longer you want to give it. So that's, that kind of gets to the dosage I'll talk about in just a second here. Uh, again, oh, this is what I was talking about before. Like when you're when you're doing a habit, a new habit over and over again, you're replacing the old habit. There's no room for the old thing. That's why I emphasize the positive here instead of talking about eliminating that. You need reminders. You know, I was talking about having like a little, you know, cue on your phone if you stand up a lot. But you can use timers or any. And I'll talk about that in more detail in just a minute. And. Uh, you want to track. This gets into the whole QS, if you were down there for David's uh, talk about the quantified self movement. This gets into the, 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 that's a whole other world right there. Just all the gizmos and gadgets and ways that you can track your behavior. And, and the, one of the intriguing things about that is that simply tracking behavior can help. Like in the worlds of weight loss and, and uh, financial management and a smoking cessation, they found that simply having people write down what they're doing you know, without any other intervention, they're doing less of the bad habits. So that, that can be very helpful. So th again, repetition. So here's your homework, your assignment for the next 30. And I do it for the next 30 work days because this is about office fitness. So I'm kind of deviating. Sorry about that, McLean. I, yeah, de deviating from the homework. But um, so like I said, I think I, I hope I've made a, a supportable case for this that we should endeavor to stand once every 20 minutes for the next 30 days. Um, there's some tools, you know, like I said, you, the reminder or cue the, of your choice, you know, can get you there. Uh, you know, if you have a phone that, that you pick up routinely, put a little reminder on there to stand up. You can set a timer. Uh, I only discovered recently, if you go to Google and do a search for set timer for 20 minutes, the so search result that it returns is a little timer going 20, 1959, 1958. Uh, so if, you know, I assume we all have internet connected web browser computers now. At the very least, you can, you can do that. And I actually do that. It's, it's a really annoying beep too, so it kind of breaks through your, the clutter you're used to. Uh, so that's, so you set up your reminder and every 20 minutes and then we're going to go in, then we're just going to track it on a simple spreadsheet that um, that's available here there's um, uh, if you go to my website sitlist.com slash spark or I've got a google doc at go to earl.co slash spark uh, or I've also got paper ones if you want in my bag I forgot to get those out and this is what it looks like so every 20 minutes you just put a little tick mark if you stood up that's all and then I'd like you and oh and the other thing is and you don't have to do it every 20 minutes. Like if you've gone through like a long stretch where you're productive and in meetings and stuff, but you can go back and say, well, in this last year, yeah, I got up, I went to the bathroom there, I stood up to present for this thing. You know, you can kind of do your, your best to have an integrity about this. This goes from eight to six. I hope you don't work that long. You know, pick out <laughs> your work day. Um, and then report it back to me. Drop that spreadsheet. If I'll, I'll get the paper ones out. If you just want to do it on paper, drop it in the mail. My mailing address is on there. Uh, or email it to me if you use one of the electronic ones, and uh, I'll pass it along to the Spark folks. And um, that's how you can keep in touch with me. I'm just Larry at LarrySwanson.com. And that's my website is sitless, or s either sitless or sitless.com, however you want to pronounce it. So thanks. I went a couple minutes over. Sorry about that. Yeah. Any questions, quickly? Yeah. Um, I just have one. Of, I've been wondering about setting up a, a standing desk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in fact, and there's issues with standing. You know, one of the, all that research is about the hazards of sedentary behavior. Stationary behavior, like standing, is troublesome too. But there's hacks around that. Um, just one quick thing. I did an Ignite talk about a year and a half ago. If you go to Ignite Seattle and look for my name, you'll find it. Um, and I, I talk a lot in there about do it yourself. So if you just want to try out a standing desk, there's dozens of ideas in there about just simple, just put a box on top of your desk, you know, and start, and put your laptop on it or, um, Yep. Standing or more sitting and standing? I advocate moving routinely. That's what I advocate. It's like sit, stand, get a treadmill desk, take walking meetings, just be routinely active at work. Yeah. We got to act like a human being, you know, for crying out loud. That's what we are, you know. So just we were designed to like chase rabbits and pick berries, you know. We should, yeah, be doing that. So. Just so you know, we, we've already put a timer in glass, so we've already got one. 
Sweet. Okay, I'll add that to my list of things. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Well, thanks so much, you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. Up next, we have Jeremy. Oh, here's the. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, thanks.